Yeah. We'll be twins. You gonna cry? Uh, is everybody self I might turn off. Yeah, I'm not worried, but I have stuff on my face, and I don't even know how that works. Okay. Hopefully, it won't. I'm it sure won't. <laughs> I hope so. Oh God. <laughs> I miss operating cameras. Can I get a quick mic check from you, please? Mm -hmm. Mic check. Okay, good. We're good. We're good. All cameras are rolling. Stand by. And New York is rolling. First speaker. <coughs> okay. Does New York need their, their names and everything? Yes, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. No, just, 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 just jury, jury numbers. numbers. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Just jury numbers. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Glad to be glad we asked. First speaker. Okay, uh, so what, what juror number are you? I was 21. Juror number 21? 34. Number 34. Um, you know, I just want to start off and just. Um, I'm curious about starting off with the de deliberations. I want to start off with that first. Take me back to that jury room when the closing arguments had concluded and you had the instructions and you were just beginning to decide was she guilty of murder. Take us into that room. What, what was it like in there? Well, first, it was 14 pages and there was no way we remembered everything that the judge had told us, so we asked for additional copies, and that took 30 minutes. But, um, what was the mood like? It was tense. It was tense. Almost surreal. Yeah, it was like, because it's, it's somebody else's life, you know what I mean? And we're the ones that have to view the evidence and go through that. And, you know, I think a lot of people really downplay jury and jury duty and jury, like, you know, even just getting a jury summons and actually even showing up, people like downplay the role that juries play in any court case. And just to know that we were the people that had to decide. And, and we all felt like we didn't have anywhere near the law experience to decide this, but we had to because that's how jury duty works. So yeah. we just had to work through it step by step. And when you first walked into that room, was everyone on, on the same page? I think that we were all on the same page as far as us thinking that, yes, yeah, she's guilty. But as far as the paper and what it read, for her to be guilty, for us to follow, we had to follow mm -hmm. the law. And that's where we got people that were like, not, well, she's guilty. We know she's guilty, but according to this paper, not guilty. Because the first part of it was murder, and it walked through it, like, it walked through what murder was, and it was the intent to kill somebody. And that's the first thing it gave us. And we all just did a show of hands, and all 12 of us said she was guilty probably within five minutes of being in there. That, that quickly. Based on the, just the definition of murder. Yeah. So then we had to go through everything else. So then we went through manslaughter. We, we ruled that one out because when she was on the testimony stand, she said that before she even went inside, she made up her mind outside the door that she was going to kill the threat. So she had already made up her mind, and so that's intent to us. You know what I'm saying? We already felt like, okay, so she knew exactly what she was going to do. It, it didn't matter who was behind that door whether it was Botham John, whether it was the maintenance man, it didn't matter who was behind that door, or even if it was an intruder, you know, they were gonna get shot, basically. And, and so that ruled out manslaughter. And there was a juror who, when we went back there, kind of was considering manslaughter. Yeah, but and she uh, didn't really understand what right. manslaughter was. So that took us a while, and we went through exactly what it was, and we actually requested more information on it because that juror said she'd heard stuff about voluntary and involuntary manslaughter, and we had no information about that. So we asked if we could get more information, and we were told no, essentially, so. Yeah, they, the, the paper that they sent back was like, uh, we already gave you everything that we could give you. Mm. And so you all went through the, the, the charging document, this 14 pages, line by line uh, together. Um, I'm 
I'm trying to get a sense of what the what the interaction was like between you all in, in that room as you had this weighty decision. You know, there's that movie Twelve Angry Men. You know, mm-hmm. uh, of this jury. Was it like that? How would you describe it? I would say, like, and like honestly, all those all the jury people that they picked were awesome and amazing people. It was it was somehow. We all kind of agree that they somehow got 12 people who could do this fairly. Yeah. I, I like Honestly, I feel like they picked the most unbiased people. I feel as if she got a fair trial just with the jury, you know what I'm saying, because of the people that sh- they picked, because we were all considering both sides. We thought about both of them. We thought about Amber. We thought about the family. We thought about Amber's family. We thought about all of that stuff. And then we obviously had only had us to interact with for about a week, a week and a half. We got real and close. We got really close, like, like a family. So it wasn't like 12 old old guys sitting in a room yeah. trying to like. It wasn't like being in a room with full of strangers. It was like yeah. being around people that you can talk to. We cried together. We laughed together. Like right. that, we, that we were all we had because we got sequestered. And what did you what did you cry about? I'm gonna be real with you. All of them was being crybabies. I I didn't cry till the end. I, I didn't cry till yesterday. Um, yeah, punishment phase was different. Yeah, guilt innocence was hard, but punishment phase there was there was a lot of crying. A lot of crying. And and, and why 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 was there? Ah, um, you want to go first? You know, it was, I mean, it was really hard to watch a mother and a father talk about a child they had lost. And you always hear about the worst thing for a parent is to lose a child. Um, And they were, you know, two feet from me, and it was just, they looked broken. But then you also had to face Amber's family and friends, and they were also broken. And it was, and we we actually didn't know we were going to have to do the punishment. Like, we didn't have a lot of information. We thought we were going to decide the verdict and Judge Kemp was going to do the punishment or at least give us, like, small ranges. When we were told to go decide between five and life, that was, like, we didn't have words. Like, being in that courtroom and versus being out here, you know, you hear a lot of different things going on out, out here. The media, they can switch things, they can flip things. I uh, know a lot of people, they looked at Amber as, oh, she's just a killer, she killed the innocent black man. But at the end of the day, what I had to realize is that all every single person that came in as a character witness to speak on Amber's behalf, they weren't in, all in the same room together. They had to come in one by one and leave. And for all of them to say consistent thing, the same thing every time, I said, dang. This was a human being, and everybody looks at her as a murderer, and I get it. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? She she had the intent to, whoever was behind that door, they was going to get popped. But actually taking the time and saying, you know what? She is a human. And listening to her her mother, her sister, her friends, Lawanda, especially Lawanda, listening to that that she changed that woman's whole life. And I said, you know what? And I looked at Amber's face because like from the video and from the lodge and stuff, you can only see the back of her head. But I would look at her face. I was looking all around the courtroom all the time. I would look at the family, pray for them. Mm -hmm. Look at Amber, pray for her. Because it was, to me, this is bigger than just a case. Because you have a person that did something, they know they're wrong for what they did, and she's sitting there and she's thinking in her head like, I don't even deserve to be here. I don't deserve to live. He should have took my place. You know what I'm saying? And I'm pretty sure a lot of people feel that way. But as a human being, as to have a heart, you have to say, you know what? Jesus forgave, I can forgive too, you know? And for me to hear everything that she went through and then for her to to hear how how she acted 
before and how she had that light and how she was vibrant before. And then to hear how afterwards she just kind of felt like she couldn't even smile. I remember there, uh, do you remember the time where, where the late, they asked one of the witnesses that stayed in the apartment, uh, how did you know that you were on the wrong floor? And she said, well, can I be honest? And she said, uh, there was this really cute, cute guy, guy. Yeah. and everybody started laughing. And when I looked at Amber, she, it was like she wanted to laugh, but she didn't feel like she was worthy enough to laugh. That was the only time she almost had a smile, yeah. And any other time other than that, like, it, like I could, I don't know how to explain it, but it's like, you know, when you look at somebody, it's like you can feel what they're feeling. And I just felt like she felt like she was less than a person because she had made this horrible mistake. And a lot of us make mistakes. And that's what we decided. After we decided that she did intend to kill him, all 12 of us agreed that it was a mistake. Yeah. She truly believed that she was in her apartment. So let me take you to her testimony then, okay. yeah. uh, because that was really, that was a remarkable moment that she actually took the stand. Uh, was that, a, first of all, a surprise to you that she testified? Th that was a surprise to me because when we were in Vore Dyer, they, they asked the question and they said, if she doesn't, if she Would uses her fifth, her? yeah, if we, they mm -hmm. use the fifth amendment, will we hold that against her? And so I was like, oh, she's not going to testify. I thought she would. I thought she would because it would help her case if it showed that she was credible and she wasn't lying. In the end, though, in deliberations, we actually decided it, it didn't work out for her because she admitted her intent to kill him, and that's kind of what we used to base our verdict on. So yeah. her, the, her testimony, you believe, hurt her case? It did. Even though I found her credible, I, it hurt her case, which is sad because I think... I don't want to speak for everybody, but for me, and I talked to a few of our fellow jurors, we don't think the defense team did very good, like at all. Toby Shook sometimes did okay, but I want to be honest, we thought Mr. Rogers did not show up for her. Honestly, the whole time I was thinking, I mean, I know, and I know what everybody else was thinking, like, ah, she needs to get the death penalty and all this stuff, but I was thinking, poor her, because she didn't even stand a chance with the defense that she had. Like, I mean, I realized that they didn't have to prove, like the burden was not on them to, to prove anything. But I thought they were gonna do something. Me too. You know what I mean? Like, show, like mm -hmm. anything. And I just felt like, I mean, I've heard that y'all are supposed to be good on cases. Like, mm -hmm. they suck. Because then they me. left her up there to be like, practically butchered by Hermes. Yeah, he so. ate her up. Well, and, and what was it in particular? What did she say that convinced you, uh, what did she say that made you decide that she was guilty of, of murder? When she was outside the apartment and she heard the shuffling, I believe she said that her intent was to go in and eliminate the threat. Yeah. And yeah. So yeah. that was the turning point? Well, that was the turning point for us deciding it was murder, but that's not where we got hung up on for hours, because we went through self-defense as well on Castle Doctrine. And we actually pretty quickly decided that neither of those applied here. So yeah, the last thing we got hung up on was mistake of fact. It's, I guess it's something that Texas has that if they were mistaken about the facts of where she was or whatever, then that could affect our guilty, not guilty. Yeah, we had to find her. Basically what the paper said was uh, if you cannot find it, reason, was it reasonable for her to believe that that was her apartment and that there was an intruder in there? If you could not find, if you could, was it we not had, reasonable? We had to believe that the state proved beyond a reasonable doubt that her that, belief was not reasonable. Which and I, I feel like the state did a good job proving that she was guilty, but I don't feel like the state proved, had enough evidence to actually prove that she was not reasonable in that. But as we went through the through the box of evidence that they gave us we found a reason you know mm -hmm. and so when she said so when she said that I, I thought I was in my apartment I thought he was a, an intruder so I shot him mm -hmm. did you believe her yeah I I believe that because just think about it you got to think about it from any point of, if you have a gun and you walk up to your door and it's cracked open and you hear shuffling inside, what would you do? I, w I personally, I would not have gone in. Me neither. I probably would have ran. 
but you know, as her as a police officer, she's probably thinking, I'm Billy, you know, I'm Billy Bad Self, so I can, I can go in there, this. I can handle yeah. it, you know. So the fact that she uh, did not retreat and that she went into, continued into the apartment, yes, which and was critical. It, it didn't help her case, but I don't think that was the turning point for any of us because we understood that that wasn't, she didn't have to follow that training since she was not on a call, but it obviously it would have helped her if she had done that. And so after uh, after that, uh, there was also the, the 911 call that they played uh, in, during the trial. How did that play into your decision making? What, what did you hear in that tape? I'm pretty sure one of our fellow jurors said that, uh, and we all pretty much agreed that almost nothing after her decision to shoot him played into our deliberations much at all. Yeah, not at all. But I will say that Listening to the 911 call, the first time, I was thinking, man, she was just worried about losing her job. But listening to it the second time, and hearing her say, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I felt remorse. I felt that she was sorry about that. But the evidence afterwards was kind of like, dang, were you sorry? Because you seen the body go by, you didn't, do anything it was like it was like once you get something that's good it it is hit by something else that's bad and it was like okay well she did this but she didn't do that but one thing that stood out to me is this a person that don't care would have been like oh snap I just shot somebody so left them in there and keep it moving try to even try to hide it but the first thing that she did was she called 911 and so I had to put that into play because who, who going to really, if you really felt bad about it, who really going to just call the police and be like, yeah, I killed somebody? You know? So do you feel like she was truly and genuinely sorry or remorseful about what happened? Definitely I, now. I seen remorse on her face yeah. on yesterday and the day before. When we gave her the guilty verdict, and, and I know that, that it's like, oh, well, of course you're going to be sad, you know, but it wasn't a, oh, man, I'm sad I'm about to go to jail. It was a, just listening to everything that the people had to say, every time they would come up and speak about Bo, it was like you could feel her feeling more of like, dang, like, this is the person I killed. Like, oh, my gosh, you know what I mean? And it was like affecting her how much yes. how people's lives she she really hurt. Well, then the reason I ask about the, the, the remorse aspect is because, um, as it was brought up in the trial, uh, the prosecutors really seeming to hone in on the fact that she didn't do CPR, uh, for example, um, or didn't do proper CPR. Did, how did that factor in to your decision? I'm going to just say it like this. I took Spanish when I was in high school and I didn't practice Spanish afterwards, and I can tell you I can know a little bit, I can understand a little bit, but if if it was time for me to speak a whole sentence, I would not be prepared for that. And so just thinking about what she said, like, you know, I only took the class, I only did it on a dummy. I've never done CPR before. I felt like, you know, she did, she was like, okay, I can't do CPR, I don't know what the heck I'm doing, so let me try to start them up. And I know I know a lot of times uh, that they, uh, I used to have coastal chondritis and they, they would do that to, you know, try to wake a person up and stuff like that. So I felt like that, you know, she was trying to do something, but you gotta think about where her headspace was. I just killed somebody. I thought I was in the right apartment. What the heck is going on? I bet her head was spinning. Just imagine, shooting somebody and you're like yeah I got him and then looking around and like I did not have all this stuff on this counter she was panicking but I do think that is an opportunity to point out that if you use your Spanish class and as, a, as an example then I definitely think police officers should have way more training with CPR if she couldn't even even if she's panicking she should be able to 
use her first aid training. That's pretty basic. Like I've done first aid and CPR training because I've mm -hmm. worked at a gym before and I can still remember what to do when I went there once. So if that's the level of training she had, then that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be acceptable. And so the backpack that had the, the unused trauma gauze and um, first aid um, tools, the fact that that was unused. That I do think she may have completely forgot about. She was so panicked. It yeah, I it concerned me. I was like, <laughs> but at the same time, you know, in a panic like that, and just how from how she sounded on the nine one one call, you could tell she was hyperventilating. Like, <laughs> I don't know, like you know, like going crazy. Like, what the heck is going on? I, what the heck is going on? And you can tell like when people are really like confused because they continue to repeat things over and over and over and she said I thought I was in my apartment I thought I was in my apartment a lot of times mm -hmm. um, okay and what about the 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 texting uh, the sexting uh, and the deleted text messages uh, that came up um, in the trial was that significant to you in terms of her uh, either her her remorse or her credibility I'll be honest, I think um, not taking into account the text messages that the prosecution showed us in relation to the punishment phase. Yeah, separate from that. We, and I especially, completely thought the sex thing was unrelated and we didn't even understand why they brought it up. We didn't see how it affected her credibility at all and it kind of felt like dragging her a little bit unnecessarily and that's how I felt about it. I, I, when they brought it up, I just kind of was like, okay, so where's this going? You know what I'm saying? Like, did she text him, like, like something? Like, did he know that this was about to occur right. or something like that? I That's what was I was thinking somewhere. at. I thought it was going somewhere. But, you know, it, it made me learn something about Amber. Mm -hmm. And that, and then once we learned from the character witness that she had been raped when she was six, it made sense it, to me. It did me too. I, we had no idea. Because, you know, uh, a lot of people that have gone through rape or molestation, sometimes you feel as if you're less than or you don't, you're not deserving of love like that or you search for love in all the wrong places. And I was like, that would make sense why she was dealing with Martin Rivera and he was married and why she wanted to stop but then never, ever stopped. You know, and I felt I, I felt like some like bad for her in a sense of like, you know, that when you in that mindset, you know, and those insecurities build up, it's like, well, I mean, who else gonna talk to me? Mm -hmm. But I didn't think that had nothing to do with the case. It had nothing to do with the case. It just helped me learn a little bit more about Amber. Um, okay, and there was some some testimony I wanted to ask you about uh, that you did not have a chance to hear. Uh, because the judge wouldn't allow it. Um, and it was the, the lead investigator, uh, Ranger Armstrong, mm -hmm. um, where he uh, was going to testify that he didn't think um, Amber did anything wrong and that she was um, justified uh, in her, her actions, that she was reasonable. He was going to say all that? He was going to say that, and uh, that there was... Um, uh, from his perspective, he should not have even been arrested. Um, if you heard that opinion from the lead investigator, w w would that have impacted your your decision? You think, or I don't, I don't think so. Um. No, that that don't make sense to me. Because me how did he not? How did she not commit a crime if she committed murder? That don't make sense. I would have just blocked it out of my head, like. Next, like I did a whole lot of some of the stuff they said in the case. Next, we, we did point out that it felt kind of like as the jury, we were privy to the least amount of information out of everyone, which at times felt odd, but it also kind of made sense. Um, and so we come up to the um, the day of the closing arguments, and you guys are in the the room, and um, you deliver the the guilty verdict. Was that um, was that a hard day for you? Or? I say the day before when they told us to go in there and 
to deliberate the first time, and then it was 5 o'clock, and we went home and left. Uh, in the hotel, I didn't even eat dinner with anybody just because I had a lot on my mind. I was like, I need to pray about this. And I was just like, we all know that she's guilty, but this paper is making it hard. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that people really take into account everything that, like, jurors have to go through a lot of times because people throw away their jury summons. But that paper, we knew that, you know, she was guilty, but by that paper, you know, we had to find something that would make it not reasonable for her to think that that was her apartment or not reasonable for her to think there was an intruder in that house. And were you thinking about all of that was... It was a lot. And it was all night because we went all back night. to the hotel we went to, and yeah. it was just a restless night. And we can't, how do we all agree on what's reasonable? Because it, it was a lot. Because you can have a gun owner in there, but then you can also have somebody that's like, I don't like guns. Mm -hmm. And be like, well, I wouldn't have did this. Well, that's reasonable for you. Well, I would have did it like this, okay? But that's reasonable for you. That might not be reasonable for me. So there was like a, a really an internal conflict within yourself yes. that you were having to work through. But I, I think one thing that, that really got us was when you found the lease. Yeah, um, I was still having a little trouble believing that the state proved beyond a reasonable doubt that she wasn't reasonable. Like it wasn't, I knew, she was guilty and I believe she murdered him. I just wanted to make sure that I went through the law as best as I could. And I don't think the prosecution brought that up, but in the lease it says, uh, the maintenance guy was a big thing for us because she obviously knew she sent her dog to her mom's house. Mm -hmm. She was aware there might be maintenance. And she said, I didn't think it'd be that late. And I think the prosecution was like, really? And then kind of moved on. But then like I pulled out her lease and it says in there that Priority emergencies can be handled 24 hours during the day and just know that this can happen. And at that point, I was just like, an ordinary person should read their lease. So and there was even an email, apparently, or some note that went out uh, yeah, it was about a, the potential for work that week. There was. Yeah, it was an email. They were talking about that it would be work. They would be working on, uh, was it like the some type of water? Said. I don't know what it was, but they would be working all week. They would be coming in to people's apartment all during that week. She didn't want her dog to get out, so she sent her dog to mm -hmm. her mom's house. So she knew, you're saying, about the potential that somebody could be in her apartment. Right, yeah. and the lease says it could happen 24 hours, d any, any hour during the day if it's a big emergency. So it was just, it ended up being unreasonable for me that she thought that he was 100% an intruder. It was, um, I, I didn't, you know, you didn't have to convince me. I, to me, I was like, hey, the, how did you not see the red carpet, the red mat, mm -hmm. the red, yeah, what is, the red floor mat? How did you not see that? And I, I guess I kind of gave her the benefit mm -hmm. of the doubt on the weed smell, but they said it still smelled like weed two days after, prior to the incident happening. So it had to have been strong in there. So if there's a crack in the door and you notice that and you stick your key right there, you got to be close enough to be like, woo. And you know you don't smoke weed, you know. So I was just like, but at that moment, you got to think. At that moment when she seen that door, she probably went tunnel vision. Mm -hmm. so, it, so it was the, uh, the red carpet and the, the smell that she should have noticed that, that really uh, stuck out to you. And then for you, it was something that almost seemed like an aside um, in, in terms of the whole case. It was just the least. I mean, it was everything, obviously, and her... One thing we all thought was odd is that she was picked and interviewed for CRT, and they said that you should have good observational skills for that. So it all added up to the unreasonableness of what she believed. Yeah, because there were multiple witnesses that, even a lady that had walked up to the door, but she didn't notice, she didn't notice the plant in the corner. She didn't notice the pea smell yeah. in the hallway, Ms. and Rose. then Yes, Miss Rose, and then what else did she, she finally, let me look up and see what the number is. And I don't know, I feel like for me, a reasonable thing that I would do if I seen my door cracked open, I would have been like, what the heck? And looked up mm -hmm. yeah. at that. So my question was the whole time, where was her mind at? Um. Okay, so I want to get to the, the punishment uh, phase because um, 
prosecutors were asking for 28 years. They were. Um, you all landed at 10. Yeah. Um, that was one of the things that was harder for me after hearing everything. Um, when we got back in there, there was a few of us crying, and I, I really started crying. And I was listening to some people say they agreed with a 28. They thought maybe 20. And um, after hearing about how his family talked about him, he seemed like just the light in their lives, and he was kind and forgiving, just caring and forgiving. And I, I said, I told everyone, I was like, I'm really having a hard time with this because we all agree that it was a mistake, and I don't think, I, th I don't think Bo would want to take harsh vengeance. I think he would want to forgive her, and I felt. I didn't feel like I had any right to speak for him, and he isn't there to talk for himself. But listening to how people talked about him, I felt like he would forgive her, and I wanted, I, I asked for a lighter sentence. And that's why it was hard leaving, and we found out there was rioting. I was like a little, I was just worried, but, and then I, I think you saw too, we found out this morning about what his brother did. And it kind of, it kind of helped us uh, feel like we ended up with the right decision. So did you, did you all see? Were you in the courtroom for that moment? No, we didn't. I, didn't I the that. judge asked us, did we want to go in there? I was the only one to say yes. Everybody else was like, no. I wanted to, I wanted to see it because. Did you see it? I seen it as, like, as soon as I got my phone back, as soon as I got on Facebook, it was the first thing that I seen, and I said, hallelujah. Because the whole time I was praying for the family, and I was like, God, you know, you said that you, in his word, he says that we're supposed to forgive. How many times are you supposed to forgive somebody as Jesus? And he said 70 times seven. And so even in stuff like that, we're supposed to forgive. And I know that if they forgive Amber Geiger, that they will be able to move on it. They will be able to heal. Because honestly, how I feel is like this. No matter how many years we would have gave Amber Geiger, it's, it's not bringing both of them back. It's not. There's no it number that could help them. Well, and so, and, and you were talking about both of them, and, and based on hearing you, it really seems like, particularly during the, the punishment phase, you were really thinking about uh, about him, about the reason why you all were in that room. We had to. I mean, it was like a wonderful, innocent person who should still be here. I think that was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. It was. And it's like we have somebody's life in our hand that took somebody else's life, taking away their whole life, you know, a life for a life. And I was thinking, you know what, well, he's right. You know, I don't know if, if Bo would be like that. What really hurt me is that, like, Bo reminded me of myself, like, literally the boy version of myself. They said he was the light in the room. That's reminded me of me. He would preach. That reminded me of me. He sung. That reminded me of me. Like, and it was like, dang, like, it, it really sucked. It, and it was like, we had to take into account both things. And I think uh, one of the jurors, one of the things that she said that really stuck out to me when we even came to 10 was that 10 is a, we understand that it was a mistake and that 10 years will be enough time for her to get back out there and, and try to do something better with her life. You know what I'm saying? Learn from her mistakes, go do something better with her life and, you know, move from this. But what we had to realize is this also when we took into account was that when she gets out, Amber Geiger is not the most loved woman in the world right now. She's not. So we had to take into account that. And a lot of people are looking at, oh, she got 10 years. She only going to do five. We don't know that. She, what if she feels so bad that she don't even take parole? You know what I'm saying? But we couldn't, we could not, as a jury, in the paper, it said, even though whatever the sentence was that they had to serve one half before parole they're eligible for parole we couldn't consider that and that's the law and we had to follow that so whatever number we picked we couldn't think about half in it and this is the only time she would do because I, to be honest 
I didn't feel like 10 years was the right number. I didn't. You wanted, what, what would you think would be a appropriate number? I feel like that's not something that the jurors should even have to do. Honestly, I felt like put in a position because if we don't give, if it's like you're put in between two. If you don't give the right number, the family will be sad. But if you don't give the right number for her, then there could be rioting also. And it's a lot of stuff that you gotta deal with when it comes to giving that number. It's a lot of outside influence and all that stuff that I was thinking about. And not only just that, but they asked for 28 years. And I'm gonna be honest and, and true. I was like, I can't give her 28 years. I agree. And it felt like when they asked for how many years he would have been on Sunday, it was 28 years, that's why they asked that. It felt like we were ask, they were asking us to take an eye for an eye for both of them. And I feel like he, he isn't someone who would take an eye for an eye. He would turn the other cheek. I know a lot of people are not happy about the 10 years, but I felt like, you know, for this case was not like any other case. You can't compare this case to any of those other officers killing unarmed black men. Those officers that killed unarmed black men, when they got out, they went back to living their lives. Amber Geiger, ever since she killed that man, she has not been the same. They could give a, a care less about, about black people. They could give a care less about them going to jail. They got off and they went on and they went about their lives. But Amber Geiger, she showed remorse in that she's going to have to deal with that for the rest of her life. And she, she realized that. And I seen remorse from her in the court. And if nobody can understand that, I feel like more people need to go ahead and go register to vote and get, answer those jury summons. And you go to it. Because a lot of people think, oh, the justice system is flawed. It's not the justice system. It's the people in your community that's going out. And some people not even taking their jury summons, their jury summons serious. You have people that are ready to go. Uh, well, I got jury duty. I don't even want to be here. So I'm going to just, uh, guilty. Come on, let's go. Oh, let's give them this many years. Because they're ready to go home. But you know what? We, said, we got sequestered for 10 days. We were away from our family. We couldn't talk to anybody. I couldn't call my mama and tell her to pray for me. I couldn't call my friend and tell her to pray for me. I couldn't call anybody to talk to, to console me after, afterwards. I was by myself. I felt lonely. And I had to deal, and it's, it, we had to deal with that. You know what I'm saying? And people don't realize that how serious that civic duty is. Because just like I said, they talk about how, how messed up the, the justice system is, but it's the juries that's picking the guilty verdict, and it's the jury that's picking the sentences. It's the people in your community is the reason why people are going to jail or not. It's not the judge. The judge didn't have to pick that. It wasn't the prosecution. They didn't have to pick the sentence. They didn't have to choose guilty or not guilty. And it sure wasn't Amber Geiger and her team that had to pick, the, pick any of that. It was all on us, the citizens of Dallas County. said that, that, that both and John um, would want to forgive. Um, why? Um, what did that say about him? Everything you learned about him and uh, how kind of a person he was and um, the impact he obviously had on his brother who told Amber that he would want the best for her. What did that say in your mind about both? It said that he's the type of person everybody would want in their life because there's just some people that have a permanent impact on you in a positive way that you can't ever replace them. And it, it's sad that that's the type of person we've lost. So. But he was, he was at the heart of y'all's decision. It made me feel like, like, man, Dang, I, I don't know. They put this picture of both of them up, of him smiling really hard. And every single picture that I seen of both them, both them, he was smiling. And I was like, man, I just, I don't know why, but I just kept expecting him to like come in there and just say something or something. And it was like, dang, he's gone. And I felt the family for that. And it was like, 
this could have been my friend. Do you do you feel like you did right? That's all. Do you feel like you did the right thing for him? Yes. Um, there's no way we can even know what he would want, but I think we all had to make a decision that we could live with and that our conscience could be sound with, and based on who we found him to be, I think we did okay. That's something that hit me when I came into that courtroom for a sentencing. I cried like a baby because I was like, did I make the right decision? Was it was it right for me to compromise with 10? You know what I'm saying? Because you put 12 different people in the room and tell them with 12 different minds, 12 different hearts and say, I need you to pick a number for this lady. You're gonna come up with 12 different numbers. And so from 12 different numbers, you gotta come everybody, what people don't realize is, is everybody gotta agree. If somebody don't agree, it messes up the whole thing. If, if, if it's just one person, it messes up the whole thing. We all have to come to one thing. People wanted five, people said that was too low. People wanted 15, 20, people said that was too high. Okay, so what are we gonna, what are we gonna do then? They put that in the decision and I, like I said, I feel like in that, the justice system may be flawed with that. I feel like, you know, and you know, that might even be more on the judge, but I really, I feel like that should not be something that 12 people sit in a room and say, this is the number of years you, de you deserve to get. I feel like that was a lot of pressure on us. Like I said, we had to think about Amber, but not only did we have to think about Amber, but we had to think about Botham, and we had to think about his family. And I wanted, I wanted, I wanted their family to feel like they got justice. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, it was a mistake. So why, why, why take another life for another life? You know what I mean? Just like he said, an eye for an eye. Because, again, it was an accident. Now was she right for pulling out that gun and making up in her mind that before she even knew what the threat was that she was going to shoot him? No, I don't think that she was right for any of that. I don't commend her for that. out of the public, and even a little bit in the trial itself, there was a suggestion that she killed both of them because he was black. Was, was race, in your mind, a part of what happened here? No, I can tell you right now, if Botham wasn't, if that wasn't even Botham's apartment, and that was a white person apartment or a Mexican apartment, whoever, it was already in her mind that whoever was behind that door was about to it was about to die. It wouldn't have mattered if they was black, white, skinny, little baby dog. It wouldn't have mattered. She already had in her mind that whoever was behind that door was about to get capped. I, I thought about that a lot. And uh, I didn't know what to think. For the most part, I was in agreement with her, but I was like, what if she had seen someone like, like her mother in there, just like a frail white woman? I don't know, but all we had to go on was her testimony, and we found her credible because she just the, she did show remorse to us. And as hard as it is, I think I really think she decided to kill who was in there from the outside. And if Black she said if she Black says she could only see whatever. a silhouette, then that's that's all we can. That's Go all we off can, yeah. We can't tell if you're lying, if you're telling the truth or not. Her testimony didn't move me at all, honestly. It, it really just put guilty in my head. But at the same time, you know, hearing from character witnesses, learning about who the person was. Because, like I said, anybody could have came in there and said, yeah, Amber has an attitude. Yeah, she used to get in fights in school and da 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 da. But nobody said that. They talked about what a great person she was and this, this and that. So I'm thinking, you know, and a lot of people had something to say about the the racist this and that. But I'm gonna be honest. Like I felt like that was like a jab, like because, 
like I said, this case is not like any other case. She did not walk up to his door like, oh yeah, this bottom, I know this bottom in here, I know he a big black dude, I'm about to go in here and kill him. It wasn't like that. It wasn't it wasn't like any other case. These other, like I said, these other cops, they was out here killing black people for just cause. Just cause they can and got off. It wasn't like that with Amber Geiger. And I've told I didn't like this. how they tried to make it racial because let's be honest, when when you when you you know, we all have said something racist about somebody. And that don't mean that you are racist. That don't mean you out here waving flags, out here talking about, oh yeah, kill all the white people, kill all the black people. I don't, you know, I've said, I've said, dang, it's a lot of white people in this room before. I've said that too. And I can only imagine maybe that's what white people think in their head too. You know what I'm saying? Off of little stuff like that. That don't mean that I don't like white people. because it, it wouldn't it, it wouldn't have did anything for the case and all that that's just speculation oh, so you, so you didn't the fact that it came up in the punishment phase that didn't and not in the trial itself no because that's they that's the DA job to make her look like a monster that's their job they trying to get a guilty verdict that's their job to make them look like a monster just like with any other case they're gonna pull out the worst stuff they know about you and throw it on the table for everybody to see of course that's their job to do that but going by the law we were only allowed to consider what was going on right at that night at that time and as much as that other stuff is important for us to understand we couldn't judge the crime itself based on that for guilt innocence. So, but 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 those things did they did they change your opinion of her one way or the other? Those it, it made me mad a little bit because like with the MLK thing, it's upsetting. It's just like you know that's not funny, but people say dumb stuff all the time. And it, nowadays. You could probably find something that every single person has said that was horrible or that they sh know they shouldn't have said, and it's it's difficult to have all of your dirty laundry aired. Yeah, and it's like, I just didn't like that they were trying to make this case racial, because don't do that, because that's going to start riots, that's going to make get people pumped up, and if you was in that courtroom, you got to see who Amber Geiger really was. You weren't in that courtroom, whether you was watching it live or not. If you, you if you, face. if you didn't see her face, mm -hmm. and you couldn't see how she was sitting over there, you know what I'm saying? I didn't see court cases where people are sitting over there and they like, shoot, I ain't worried about it. I'm gonna get off, and they not worried about it. But you know what I seen on the ninth and the tenth day that they had us in there in that courtroom. I seen remorse in her face. The Holy Spirit even showed me that she was feeling less of a person. And this was way before the character witnesses even came in and said that. And that was just confirmation. And I was like, wow. Like, God, I was just like, you know, one thing that God has t taught me about, you know, forgiveness is that not only do you have to forgive others, but you also have to forgive yourself. And I wanted Amber to forgive herself. I wanted the family to forgive Amber. And my prayer came true because when I when I didn't I didn't you know I felt like that would have been their healing that's where they would have got their healing from matter of fact I know that's where you get your healing from when you forgive and you let go and you let God and so when when I got in the car we got in the van and I was uh, on Facebook on my phone and I seen that video I just can't I couldn't do nothing but give. God all the praise and all the glory because God moved in that courtroom and if y'all don't know God like that you wouldn't understand and that's why so many people are mad and they saying oh he got a slave mentality and this this and that no he don't have a slave mentality he has a heart
And when you're when you're a child of God, you bear his fruit. And God's fruit is love, kindness, patience, peace, all that. And he showed that in that court. And I think what he did is he changed the dynamics of everything. He even made the judge get up and give her a hug. Because we so worried about hate that we're not even thinking about re rehabilitation. Like, okay, she killed somebody. So don't you want this person to get better so that they won't kill somebody again? Like, what, what, is, what is this world coming to, to where we can't forgive somebody? It's a crime to forgive? That doesn't make sense to me. And what I've told everybody since is that I don't care what you think should have happened. There are only 11 other people in this world whose opinions I will listen to on what should have happened that day. And that's the other 11 jurors, because nobody else went through and saw everything that we had to see. Even some of the evidence, they, you know, a lot of that stuff, when we looked in there, it was some stuff that we didn't even see. They didn't even put out there on the TV or anything. Some of that was new to us. So not everybody got to see everything. And if you weren't in that courtroom, you know, I feel like a lot of people are really mad about the sentence. And I understand that because it's like, oh, she got a slap on the wrist. But for her to get guilty in the first place and not not guilty, that was that was something big in itself. And are you um, are you different today? Are you a different are you a different person today than you were two weeks ago? What? Yes. Yeah. Um, it's one of those experiences that we're gonna have to carry with us for the rest of our lives because it's I've never been through the emotional ringer as much as I have the last week and a half. So of course I'm different. I wouldn't say I'm a changed person on my outlook on life I just understand life a little better I think this this whole thing has changed me tremendously uh, I grew a lot like I don't, I'm literally not the same person I was when I first walked into that courtroom that on that first day versus now I'm not the same person at all and at, like when I got out it made me want to you know, be more family involved, forgive people more, and actually heal from things that people have brought us through. And I think that's one thing that the world needs to realize is that while we so worried about hate, 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 you know, we could do a whole lot more saving with love. And we look at all these people that are going to jail for this, this, and that, and we look at them as a criminal, criminals. And we don't look at, we take, when they, when they go behind there, they still human. They made mistakes just like all of us. Amber Gagger made a horrible mistake, and I know she feel bad for that. You know what I'm saying? We all are human. We all make mistakes. We all say stupid stuff. That's in our nature. It's not meant for us to be perfect. And we should focus more on love and the positive, the positive stuff and not on the hate. Like, do something good for this city to remember. Like, name a street after both of them. You know, stuff like something. that. Focus on focus on the love. Too many people are focusing on on the, oh, she didn't get nothing. But you got to think about it. What we took into consideration when we sat in that room and we even came up with the number, when we finally got to the 10 as a collective group, it wasn't, uh, oh, yeah, she, gonna, she probably going to do half and get off. Nah, it was, OK, we realized that she made a mistake. And when she get out of here, we, we want her to be able to rehabilitate herself and get out here and do something better because we know it's in her. She helped save a lady that, that was on crack. So it's in her. So I felt like we gave her some time. I really, the, I thought that she might need more time in there. Not just, you know, only because I say, when she get out of here, the world is still going to look at her as the horrible Amber Gagger. You know what I'm saying? They're not going to look at her as, oh, this lady that made a mistake. They're not looking at Amber Geiger like that. They're looking at her like a monster. And so what we have to realize is that she's just a human just like any of us. And if you walked up to your door and you seen it cracked open and you had a gun on you, what would you do?
thing, I just wanted to make sure they got in. They talked about the name of the trees. You talked about the, the love out there. I mean, what is Bozum's legacy on the city and on these trees? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Obviously, Bozum has had an impact on, on, on the people he knew, but then you all got to know him in, in a real way as well. Uh, yes. What, what, what's his, what will be his legacy in your life? What do you think his legacy will be here in Dallas? And I think a reminder to be the light and to be the love in people's lives. Yes, to be people's person. You know, uh, I learned a lot from both of them, and he wasn't even in that courtroom. And, you know, it was sad because I, I wanted to hear from him. I wanted to talk to him. I wanted to get to know him. But, you know, we, had, we got to know him through his family and friends and everything. And just from learning about him, it made me want to continue and feel good about, man, Okay, I am doing something good when I, when I do, when I say something nice to somebody, or when I, when I'm nice to somebody, or when I walk in a room and I'm smiling instead of frowning and looking at somebody. You know, love is way better than hate. And I think one thing that Botham can teach us all is that we should all love each other instead of hate each other. And I, and I honestly think that if Botham would have just got shot and not killed, I think he would have forgiven Amber Geiger. And I can't speak for speak for him. But just off the character and everything, and especially from his brother, if he's any, if he's was more than what his brother was, I, there's no doubt in my mind that he would have forgave, forgiven that woman. His dad even said that they would probably be friends. Oh, really? That's what he said. Wow. If she had had an opportunity to even talk with him for 60 seconds, he said, he believes they would, they would have been friends. I think that. I just, I, I honestly wish that it would have been an awkward moment, like, uh, oh my gosh, I just walked in your apartment. I really feel as if they would have been the best of friends because she was a light and he was a light as well. Thank you all very much. I really do uh, appreciate your time. And uh, uh, just from the bottom of my heart, I mean, I, this is what I do for a living. and we cover these stories all the time, um, but to have people like you um, giving us a glimpse of what you experienced and uh, in turn helping us um, understand the things that are important in life and how we could potentially turn um, a horrible, horrible thing into a positive. Um, for you all to, to share that message is just the honor of my life. So um, I really do appreciate you talking to us and sharing your story. Thank really you. Do. Yes. Thank you. And thank you for your service on the jury as well. Thank you, John. Yes. Thank you. Good job. Thank you so much.